everybody, good evening. Uh, thank you so much for coming. I like to try and start on time. So, my name is Victoria Shaw. I'm here tonight. Um, I'm part of the Upper Saddle River Allendale Coalition, which is being mentored by the Mawa Municipal Alliance. I think uh, many people probably know about the MMA. The president of the MMA, Carolyn Blake, is here tonight uh, with a lot of other really important people who work with the MMA. So I just want to give a shout out to the MMA and thank them for mentoring uh, up beside the River Allendale. So tonight, um, in conjunction with the Hackensack University Medical Center and the Northern um, Highlands Regional High School, thank you everyone for coming together to put this forum together. So the topic, of course, is um, you know the opiate heroin epidemic. Um, everyone at this point is aware that in our community, in our society, in our country, we have a very, very serious problem. Um, there's just no room for stigma or judgment anymore at all. Uh, the condition is an illness and it absolutely requires medical attention, and that's a fact. So um, I wanted to share with you tonight's format. I'm gonna be very brief because I wanna get to the keynote speakers and then the panelists. So we have two wonderful medical doctors from Hackensack that um, uh, Balpreet Grewal Verp will uh, introduce, and she's the Director of Community Engagement at Hackensack. And after the two wonderful doctors do their presentation, which is about 40 minutes, and we tried to keep it to that time uh, for a reason. We don't want to lose you. We want to get to the Q&A. We have some wonderful panelists who are here tonight as volunteers, um, and they will be on the panel along with the doctors to answer questions. So tonight on the panel, we have Lauren Wright, who is a family advocate who lost a brother to a heroin overdose. So you will hear from Lauren before we start the Q&A. We have Lainey Bonifaci, I probably didn't get it just right, uh, who's an LCSW. And we have Gail Cole, who is the founder of Hope and Healing after addiction death, and Gail lost a son to a heroin overdose. So we have a very, very special panel with a lot of experience. So at this time, um, Balpreet's gonna come up and she's gonna introduce both keynote speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vicki, and uh, good afternoon. Like Vicki said, my name is Valerie Grewal Burke. I'm the director of community engagement at Hackensack University Medical Center. Um, we're honored to participate in this extremely timely conference to bring together parents, teachers, nurses, advocates, and students to address the opioid epidemic. I'd especially like to thank the Upper Saddle River Allendale Coalition and both boards of health for sponsoring today's program. Thank you, Northern Highlands Regional, for hosting us this evening. And finally, a big thank you to Upper Saddle River Mayor Joan Minichetti and Allendale Mayor Liz White. Thank you so much for having us. I'd like to introduce two of our very own doctors at Hackensack University Medical Center, Dr. Michael Kelly and Dr. Jerry Joseph. Dr. Michael Kelly serves as the chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Sports Medicine at the hospital, and he's also the chair of the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. Dr. Kelly travels the country to lecture physicians, healthcare executives, and others about minimizing the use of opioids before, during, and after surgery to prevent addiction. He's been performing total knee replacements and treating sports-related orthopedic injuries for 30 years and was instrumental in establishing the Hackensack University Medical Center Orthopedic Institute. Dr. Kelly has won numerous awards and is, super, is spearheading a program for personalized pain management, which I think you're gonna get into later on today, including the use of genetic testing to determine which patients are more at risk for addiction. Thank you, Dr. Kelly, for being here. Right next to Dr. Kelly is Dr. Jerry Joseph. He is our inpatient psychiatrist and substance abuse specialist. Dr. Joseph and our physicians in behavioral health play a vital role in fighting this disease and epidemic because we know that when we take a team-based approach, we have better outcomes. Dr. Joseph also provides education and clinical supervision to New Jersey Medical School of Psychiatry and Medicine. Thank you all for being here uh, and for listening to this very important subject matter. It's absolutely essential that we work together in fighting this epidemic. Um, just 
in the United States. We lost 64,000 people to drug overdose in 2016. That's a significant number. In New Jersey, we lost 2,300 um, residents just last year. That is a 35% increase in just 12 months. That's a significant number. There's only four other states that, are high, that had a higher percentage increase in fatal overdoses. In fact, um, this is our second opioid form in just, well, less than 10 days. We had one on the 17th with the Attorney General and the New Jersey Health Commissioner. And the theme that day, or the reoccurring message was that we can't do this alone. We can't do, just do this as a hospital or just doctors. We need the support of schools like this cell, uh, like here, mayors, of course, doctors uh, in other, other neighborhoods, um, nurses, school coaches, teachers, students, and of course, we see uh, law enforcement here today. You also play a large part in fighting this epidemic. So together, uh, we need to help in preventing, educating, and fighting this large issue. And um, at the end, I think we're gonna have a, a good Q&A, so if you have questions, please free, feel free to ask our, our doctors. So with that said, um, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Michael Kelly to begin his presentation. Thank you. Thank you for such a kind introduction. Um, it's very nice of you to, to greet me so well. Usually when I was cheering either for my daughter or my son on the playing fields out back, either Bosco or IHA was probably losing and I wasn't treated as so nice. But <laughs> it's awfully nice to be here. Um, I date back a little bit on this uh, passion for the opioid issues to four years ago. I feel tremendously lucky to have been asked by a company and industry who works in a different way of managing pain to give a talk on the burden of opioids at a big meeting in, in Orlando. And um, I, you know, we use opioids. We were happy to have patient-controlled analgesia, IV opioids. I do knee replacement. It's a very painful operation. And we were thrilled to have the onset of these opioids come the late 90s and early 2000s. We, it was much better than giving you a shot of morphine when you were screaming and then watching you be drowning in the medicine for the other two hours. And, this way we could keep a steady state. But having done the research for that talk, I realized that, guess what? I was part of the problem. And every one of our orthopedists, every one of our oral surgeons, every one of all of us are part of the problem when we talk about diversion and other means for this. And um, we came back and four years ago, we stopped intravenous opioids for our joint replacement service at Hackensack. Didn't receive much attention was a huge step in the right direction. And the three people who were the happiest were the patients, the nurses, and the therapists. Nobody was drowning in their medication the night of surgery. Today, 95% of our patients are out of bed, in a chair, or ambulating on the day of surgery. They're not throwing up. They're not scratching and itching all over. They're not drowning in their medicine and can't get out of bed. And it's proven to be a, a really advanced in the way these days, we, they would ask us, why 90 pills? Back then, it was, when can I get the next prescription? And so we've made a lot of progress. So while we're going to see some pretty, pretty remarkable statistics and some of the things I'll show you, there is hope. You know, we've got different kinds of laws around this country. Sometimes it's an overreach, and, the, and New Jersey is one of the toughest ones for prescriptions post-operatively. We're seeing nationally prescriptions going down and deaths going up. China has been bringing a lot of fentanyl into this country. They're being used in pills and heroin and, and various things. So that's a little disappointing to me. I mean, I was at a meeting in Florida lecturing in December, same trend. Prescriptions down, deaths up. And so it's, it's an issue. So I'm gonna share some with you. I was actually asked to give the introductory lecture at the national DEA meeting on opioids this year. I think they wanted one doctor they didn't want to put in cuffs at the end of the lecture, but um, <laughs> it was interesting as we thought about talking about our personalized pain management. Dr. Kissin, who works with me, is in Upper Saddle, whoever's here with me tonight, is actually gonna have the first patients doing this. Um, their response was, what a great way to do fraud and abuse by getting too many urine tox screens. So everybody has a little different picture. Now, if we move on, I'm gonna share with you some of the data that um, I shared with the DEA back then and they shared with me as we look at some of these numbers. And it's rather remarkable, right? 
2014, 47,000 drug overdoses, deaths. One death every 11 minutes. Approximately 128 per day. 19,000, a little less than half, were related to opioid abuse and pain relievers. We have most of these data are back because we don't, and, and one of, there is an attorney general with the name Grewal, who you may remember the introductory person. But he, he's done an incredible job with all of this, but trying to get real-time data is almost impossible. But they're working on it in New Jersey, thanks to him. So you'll see some of this data, and I'm not just showing you old data because I was too lazy, it's because the new data is not here yet. And so if we now come to the next year, you can see the numbers are going up. We're down to one death every nine minutes, 151 per day. And again, large number related to opioids. In 2016, as we heard earlier, the number was almost, if not over, 60,000 deaths. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. That's all. Actually, when you start putting this all together, you'll see some of the people giving this lecture. I almost had a free trip to Vietnam in 1973, but my draft number was a little high. We're losing more people to the opioid epidemic than we did in that war. Brings it to a pretty granular level. Now let's look at New Jersey. You heard just a little bit about this. This just came through NJ Biz a week ago. Six leading cause of death in New Jersey. 765 deaths already this year, 2018. So that was probably a month ago. This was the data from 2016 that was reported to you. 2,221 2, deaths in 2016, 85% related to opioids, so in the, the drug overdoses. And guess what's happening this year? If we annualize the deaths to date, it's over 3,000. And you heard how quickly we were, we were like the fourth leading uh, state in growing drug overdose deaths to opioids. We may win that race, unfortunately, if we don't get our act together and try to prevent this. Let's look at the costs. It's unbelievable. I was looking at some people who were um, working, their children were having troubles, and the dependents were causing them to lose their insurance because they were having trouble getting in and out of different places to get help. I mean, if you don't have a lot of money in this world, it's pretty hard to get rehab help. The state's trying to work on that. It was nice to hear more about it last week. Look at this, 2015, CDC, 28 billion direct health care cost, 20 billion lost productivity, I guarantee you that's just a low number, non-fatal overdoses, incarceration, other reasons for missing work, 21 billion fatal overdoses, 7 billion plus criminal justice costs. The Council on Economic Advisors said this is nonsense, this is way too small, it's almost 3% of GDP. So it's, it's getting the cities, it's getting the hospitals, it's getting the states, and it's getting the country in terms of this. And here you can see the 2016, again, over two million people, opioid use disorders, and look at the numbers economically. They're really dramatic, and they affect all aspects of economics, not just the overdoses. So now we'll move on. This is a map of the United States, and I'm probably still a little tough on making out all the states, but look at those dots. In those states, this is a little bit dated, a couple years back, 12 states had more opioid prescriptions written in a given year than they had population, right? So you could have had uh, leftover opioids could be abused and misused, and, and these states are changing. We know Jersey's probably may have a dot like that, New Hampshire may have a dot like that. People from um, Nantucket called last year trying to get some ideas of how we were managing post-operative pain, because even in that affluent community, they couldn't afford the economic costs of what was going on to that island. But 12 states have more prescriptions than people. And how do we get here? 70 million people prescribe per year opioids for post-surgical pain. That's probably coming down, thank goodness. One in 15, so one of the take-home messages here is one in 15 who get involved in this, even in the acute setting, the stuff I do, the prescriptions I write, thank God they're very few, will go on to long-term use or abuse. So you can obviously see how that adds up over time. The use of perioperative pain management using opioids has been going on a long time. Back in the mid-90s, they made it the fifth vital sign, right? So not just respirations, pulse, blood pressure, et cetera. It was how's your pain being managed? And we even have what are called HCAP scores in the different hospitals, which are designed to evaluate us and your experience in the hospital. 
and how was your pain managed? And you can answer it in a variety of different ways and using a score. So if your pain was perfectly managed, you had too many opioids because some pain is not unreasonable. Many hospitals in this country now eliminate that word and use the word comfort. So we try to tell you that we hope to make your pain in the, somewhere in the three range. We use very little opioids. They're usually for rescue now, and I'll go into that a little bit later. But hydrocodone or Percocet has been the, almost the number one prescribed pill in the country on several occasions, certainly for Medicare a couple years ago. That's us, not just the kids. Us, Medicare. I got there this year. <laughs> Tackling the post-surgical opioid problem requires preventing the adverse events, all the things that go on when you take opioids. And, and while you may get some pain relief, you may be throwing up, you may be nauseous, you may be dizzy. Promoting multimodal care, I'll discuss that. That's the way most of us are approaching, at least in the acute setting today. And reducing misuse, abuse, and mostly diversion. I never really understood what diversion meant when I first saw the word, but we'll, 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 we'll figure that out shortly, and I'll show you how, how incredible it is. This is not a lecture on drug, um, at people selling drugs to people. Very few start opioids by buying the drugs on the street. They usually start by our prescriptions, or what's in your medicine cabinet, or what somebody brought to a party. I was seeing, hearing something, a recent story I saw, where a poor mother uh, at a high school graduation party said the boys came home, went down to the basement to have a little bit more time uh, partying, woke up in the morning, and both of them had overdosed. Two. I mean, it just breaks your heart. So here we go, looking at some of the adverse events. So when you're taking these, what happens when you have an adverse drug event? And again, you can look at the cost here. Um, it, obviously, length of stay, readmissions, and cost all are minimized when you stay away from opioids to be used in the management of post-operative or acute pain. And it's very clear, and you can see the numbers. They're not insignificant. This is probably one of the biggest take-homes here, and certainly when I lecture to physicians. The initiation of short-term opioid therapy in the acute setting, post-operatively, post-fracture, in the ER, may lead to long-term use and or abuse. And if you look here, these are just two representative studies, not to work through the literature with you, but they're two different ones. We know that spinal problems and nerve pain are really difficult to manage. And a lot of those patients come in already on opioids because it is so difficult to manage. But here's it, cervical spine means your neck. So if you look at a neck um, study where they had surgery, approximately one third of these patients were still using opioids one year later. So they were given opioids post-operatively, and then they were continuing out to 12 months. One third. 18% of that third had not ever used opioids before. Because we know if you're using opioids when you have surgery, that's a problem for the surgeons. Because what happens is if you're using them, you become hyperesthetic. So whatever pain we're going to inflict on you, and you've been using opioids all these months, your pain is going to be perceived as much worse. So we've got to get you off the opioids, and we have a much harder time dealing with your pain post-operatively. If we now look upper extremity surgical procedures, now some of these were soft tissue, which are usually not as painful. Some were bony in the wrist and the elbow. And this is what the version is. So this wasn't so much about who was still using the opioids, but how many pills were left over from your prescription sitting in your medicine cabinet to be abused or misused. And here you can see, Everybody was given a prescription for 30 tablets, which they filled, and they had to call in at six weeks and say, how many pills do I still have left? It's almost 5,000 in this small group. Almost two-thirds of the pills had not been utilized, were not needed for pain, and had not been disposed of. And the, the, the policeman here today had something where you can dispose of your pills outside. I saw that. And many of us had no idea what to do with these pills. They sat in the medicine cabinet because you know how many people I see I stopped playing, but at Indian Trail, they have a softball league, and guys with gray hair like me are playing. They don't stretch. They run from first to second. They're not competitive, by the way. They don't want to win. <laughs> and they pull their hamstring, and they come in, and they ask us to take care of them. And I said, did you take any Advil or, or Tylenol or whatever? They said, no, nah, my wife just had her, her wisdom teeth done. We had 30 extra pills from the oral surgeons. I hit a couple of perkers. That was good. 
you know, did a couple of perks and then went to the bar and the, the whole thing. And so we, we hear it all the time. And, and that's, that's something that has to change in our society. Um, and, and how you do it, you know, at least around here, you can go to the, the police offices and uh, or police departments and get ready for pills in a legal fashion. Can't give them back to your doctors because we can't take them, nor do we want them because we're just going to get in trouble. This is one of the slides that bothers me. Well, you can see on the top side, the Medicare age group, still a problem. And I'll show you something about ages and this epidemic, because none of us in this room are not involved. Take a peek at the kids. I encourage my kids like crazy. I taught every, my, my wife is still, she's still coaching lacrosse, and Franklin Lakes has never played it or seen a game other than her own. Um, but we all tried. It's nothing better than a soccer practice at 6.30 in November when daylight saving times is over and a mother's late and you're sitting there by yourself. But it, we wanted to encourage that. Get them off the streets. Don't do something bad. Check this out. Adolescent males who participated in organized sports, this was a, this was a well done study. Questionnaires, you get 85% of questionnaires and that's just a tremendous study. That's what this was. Two times the risk of being prescribed an opioid medication. Four times the odds of misusing opioids to get high, 10 times the odds of medical misuse of opioids due to taking too much. I got a call from Duke University, being a graduate of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Those are always bothersome to me, but it was a fellow, played, his son was playing lacrosse for Bergen Catholic, and they were down at Duke in a tournament, and he hurt his knee. He went to the Duke ER, and he calls me from there, and he's outraged because they gave his son Tylenol with Cody. He took all the pills, threw them out, and gave them some Tylenol and some Advil to get through. And so the word is, is getting out there. And I think mostly the ERs are getting better as well. But how many times have we heard the story? And an injury, a surgery, prolonged, and then problems. Um, it's all too common And that I'm, My practice is all knees, and I took care of the Nets for 10 years when we were actually pretty good. I hadn't moved to Brooklyn yet. And um, so I took care of a lot of kids, did a lot of ACLs, it's a huge number of ACLs. And um, I had to go back and, and start trying to think, of it, did, did I have some of these fatalities or, or, or did I know about it? Because I had done an article in the, in the New York Post about overdoing you know, 12 months a year in the soccer, 12 months a year in the lacrosse and all the injuries we were seeing. And I'm very worried about it, particularly in, in when we began to see so many female ACLs coming out. And, um, but it, it happens, and, uh, and the stories are way too frequent. How about collateral damage? You're not even born yet, and you got a problem. Look at this data right here. On the maternal hospital stage related to opioid use, doubling in this decade period from, uh, or six years, excuse me, 06 to 2012. You can see um, the maternal stays in the blue, but how about the red guys, the neonates? And we see them in our neonatal uh, NICU. It's a problem, and they're starting out with two strikes behind them. Um, and we've got to help these people as well. Again, one of the reasons that these, um, the de decreasing the number of prescriptions, and within those prescriptions, decreasing the number of um, pills is related to this data. So if you look here on your left, the, the lines are probability of still using opioids. Um, the, the, the solid line is a year, the dotted line is three years, and here you can see day's supply of the first opioid prescription. So the more days that were supplied, the more people who were still using at those periods of time. And the more pills per episode of those prescriptions, again, you can see a similar. We don't know where those numbers go out. Is it seven days? Is it the lowest dose? Should it be 10 pills, five pills? Everybody's different. We're hoping that we can get a better grip on that as time goes on, because even the DEA says that a lot of times you go from anything you want to over-restrictive and somewhere in the middle you meet. But hopefully we'll get that data. We actually have formed at Hackensack a um, opioid minimization committee, which I chair with the pharmacy. Um, not typical that an orthopedist would be in the pain management world, but we have a multidisciplinary. Our obstetricians have stopped with their sections. Um, every part of the hospital has changed. Thoracic surgeons use very little anymore. They're using nerve blocks and Tylenol, IV Tylenol. It's very nice of some of the pharmaceutical companies to help us out. IV acetaminophen is an outstanding drug, except it's $25 an injection compared to $0.25 cents for two pills. 
and they just jacked it up another 10 bucks when we're trying to fight the opioid crisis and we have an IV opioid shortage. You come in with trauma, you need your pain managed. Not very helpful. And it would be nice if Congress got on some of those people. Again, uh, just take a look at the one on the right there. So my world, although I just changed to the, the 65 to 84 one, 45 to 64, look at that. It's not the kids at the top. It's the people getting their total hips and total knees by Dr. Kissin and I, right? Us, everybody in here. And, and Medicare, not insignificant. So everybody's in here, everybody. And, and it's a slide that really gives us, again, it's a decade's worth of data, but if, if the problem with all these slides is Look at the curve of the graph. It's going from the lower left to the upper right, and it's not the stock market, right? So it's very frightening. We keep trying, and it's been very frustrating to many of us. And this is what I talk about. 68% of people using pain relievers non-medically obtain them from a friend or relative. Look at the percentage of drug dealers involved in this study. Less than 5%. So diversion matters. You've got to manage your pills that are sitting in your house. That's one way we can help, for sure. In the state of Colorado, when I was out there maybe a year ago, one of the things that one of the guys was running on an election on was having some of these um, places to relieve the pills within X number of miles of everybody in the state by year X. And that was one of his big things, and, um, and well received. So, we all know what happens when you can't afford the pills, and one of the things I'm just, worried about a little bit is as the prescriptions come down they get harder to get and people who do have legitimate pain or legitimate problems they need to get to my partner here so that they're not going out to try to solve those cravings um, in a way that may give them some a lot of trouble and again if we look here prescription opioid related deaths um, as we look at 98 out to 2014 again opioids but look at the, just the curve in the last couple of years so heroin's on the lower line the opioids are on the top, and there's been a steepness to it. It's not clear to me why that's happening. It is on the heroin side, but not on the opioid side. Um, so here you, you know, four and five new heroin users started out using prescription painkillers. So now I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the good news. Sorry, I was a little bummer in that first part. Um, it, it's interesting, when I give some of these lectures nationally, we have usually some videos chronicling some of the problems whether it be an adult or a teenager or whomever. And I see the same thing, like five meetings in a row, and the first 10 minutes of my talk, I'm in tears every time. It's, it's a very, very difficult thing. Multimodal pain management. That means we're using two or more ways to solve your pain at a same, in the same instance to try to manage your pain. So rather than just giving you huge doses of opioids, we now are going to try to go somewhere where the pain is generated, whether it's in the central nervous system in the brain, the spinal nervous system in the back, right? Or where the injury takes place. In my case, it's always the knee. So the stimulus is at the knee, travels up the spine to the brain, and if you can look on the right, we're not gonna go through all these, but we have a large number of different medications. We have techniques to do nerve blocks um, to manage the pain. So I kind of liken it like there's not one route to G GW Bridge, there's five of them. And instead of just blocking route four, we get out and we block each of the five and together, we call it synergistically, they add up to pain relief without opioids. And so I'll show you what we're, we're doing now in our world. So this was me coming along since, when I finished, 1985 until just four years ago. You'd give weak opioids, Pain didn't get solved, you get more potent opioids, and didn't have any more problems, you just have more and more opioids. And the adverse events that went with them, pain may have been well, but we couldn't get these people out of bed for two days to get rolling with their recoveries, et cetera. So today it's very different. And sometimes trying to tell a patient that actually Tylenol is a good pain reliever, I used to just think it was for my kids' fevers, but it's a hell of a drug, and it's cheap, and it's well tolerated as long as you don't have liver problems, and we use it a great deal. Um, Anti-inflammatory medications, many of us use. I can't get on the paddle court without a couple Advil. It's one of the things about getting old is you now have to set your alarm on Saturday at 6.30 to take your Advil so you can play an 8.30 paddle match. I mean, that seems a little bit bad. Um, 
And then COX-2 inhibitors are a different type of anti-inflammatory that are more selective. You know it as Celebrex. Gabapentinoids you may have seen on the TV when you hear about Lyrica for diabetic pain as a neurologic pain management. And then local anesthesias, medicines that we can shoot all over the knee or the hip that, um, that basically the medications like Novocaine for your dental work, but it elutes out over two days, not four or five hours later. And so it's been very helpful. And then as we move up, we have different ways to block different nerves for the different joints and different medications. And we still do use opioids. There are times when the, the pain is just that bad and trauma, bad trauma comes in. They need them, they definitely need them. And there's an IV opioid shortage. A lot of it having to do with the terrible hurricane in Puerto Rico, where a lot of these places were, were located. Both intravenous, just intravenous fluids were having a tremendous shortage around the United States. So here's what we're doing today, very different than when I got to Hackensack. Preemptive means we're trying to get some pain management on board before the pain evolves. And so before your surgery, you're given a, um, basically a, a Celebrex tablet, an anti-inflammatory, a couple of Tylenol, and one of the gabapentinoids, which is the, the neurologic pain. Then you get into anesthesia, and usually you have a spinal anesthetic, say for a knee replacement. Um, you get you get tired, so you don't have to be worried that you're up listening to the procedure the whole time. But it's a simple uh, intravenous, um, um, you know, spinal anesthetic, so it doesn't last too long because we want you out of bed and walking that evening. Peripheral nerve blocks are the types of things. So, in your knee, you have certain nerves that innervate. Some of them manage the, the muscles at work, we call those motor, and some of them manage the, the sensation where you can be numb in certain areas. And so we can block either the ones that do both, we can block the ones that just use sensory, but either way, they're very, very effective. And we use a, one of the corticosteroids called dexamethasone, and then the injection techniques I told you. So each step of the way, we're working on things. We're working on things before, during, and then post-operatively, Again, you don't see what was called patient-controlled analgesia, where you got the button and you kept pressing. The machine knew how much you did, and if you pressed too much, you got salt water, but you didn't know it. But, so, um, acetaminophen, again, the Celebrex, and we do use uh, some narcotics, some opioids. Um, and at the time of discharge, one of the things we haven't done well is that people tend to take pain medicine when they have pain. And so when you've had an insult, like a, a replacement of some sort or a bad trauma, we like you when you go home, unless you have trouble with the medications, to take your Tylenol around the clock. Don't wait till you have pain and you have another 45 minutes or an hour before it starts to work. You take your anti-inflammatory in a staggered way around the clock. And so that when we get to, call, our navigator calls you or we see you two weeks or so, a lot more people are close to being completely off opioids than they ever were. And, um, when we have the question and answer, we might talk to Dr. Kissing because he's on the front lines there and the difference in the way he's been prescribing things, um, along with the, the, the laws. And so we've, we've been very happy, um, and, and we're, not, we're not special. A lot of people do this around the country. Uh, I got some of this stuff from a good friend of mine at Duke who's doing very similar things. And, and what we can do now at Hackensack, thanks to our informatics, is we're now going to be able to go and look at a quarter and look at what our drug use was from the opioids. Because when you look at these studies from these places, the pain level should be very similar. So that won't distinguish it. It's a middle equivalence of morphine or opioids that go down. So you're getting the same pain management for much less opioids. That's the goal. And that's what's happened with this type of treatment. This is of a, a nerve block. This is how some of these are done, close to the knee, knowing the innervation, knowing the anatomy. And the last part, and then I'll end, is we're, we're I've been in, um, when I got involved in this, someone showed me a little bit of this idea here, and we're just getting involved now, looking at behavior, genetics, and toxicology, trying to get an idea of the risk for um, addiction, and as well uh, for, as the risk, how can we manage your pain appropriate for you? They're gonna manage my cancer for me not because I have a certain type of cancer, because I have biomarkers, or I've got genetic defects, or I've got this, or I've got that. 20% of you, if we gave you morphine, won't be able to metabolize it. You'll throw up, but you won't have any pain relief. But we know that ahead of time. And the psychiatrists have been doing with antidepressants for years. So we can figure out 
using one of these addiction risk survey that you see on the side there, just six or seven questions, it's validated. I mean, we can get an idea of who's at, somewhat at risk, and then we can, this is what it looks like. You know, it doesn't take you too long to figure it out, and we, eventually we should probably have every one of our patients on this to give us a little bit of an idea um, of who uh, has a potential for a more risk. And then we can associate your genetics with a little biopsy, just take a little swab right out of your cheek, and then we can track into high, medium, and low risk of where you are with either addiction profiles and or your genetic background, which medicines will work for you or won't work for you, and we'll come up with a scorecard. So if you look all the way on the right, you'll see the addiction side, the addiction risk. Again, green is low, red is high. The, we also can risk your, your ability to have a clot formation, so when we give you medication to minimize that, we don't have to use high-risk medications. And then you can see the various medications either have a green light, a red flag, or yellow. So you're either good to go, maybe okay, or not good to go. And we can, we can use this to manage your pain and write for the appropriate medications. That's what we're hoping, we're just starting. So maybe next year I can come back and give you a little of the data. So in summary, obviously we know this is an epidemic. Many people in here have been hurt by it. It's not just a patient problem, hospitals, physicians, all the way through the, the whole tree there, and families in particular. Maybe it's avoidable, we're certainly trying that. Um, and again, state and federal legislation is on the way, hopefully to help and not make it even harder. Thanks very much. Dr. Jerry Joseph, just want to begin by saying that I'm uh, extremely humbled to be able to speak in front of you. Um, I was born and raised here in Bergen County, and giving back to the community is something that I've always wanted to do. And I appreciate you guys coming out and taking the time to listen. So let's begin our discussion on opiates. <sighs> Disclosures, I have none. <laughs> so what are we looking at here? This is the opium poppy. That white sappy material you're looking at is opium. It's thought to be the first um, opiate and what other opioids were synthesized from. It dates back to prior to 3400 BC in ancient Mesopotamia. Um, it's cited that ancient uh, Egyptians and Persians would use it both for medical and illicit purposes even back then. Um, jump forward to 1805 and morphine and codeine were isolated from opium. Morphine was initially used to treat opium addiction but later it was found out that morphine was actually 10 times more euphoric than opium itself. Um, from there, opi uh, morphine misuse began. If you move forward to 1874, diamorphine or diacetylmorphine, which is a chemical structure of heroin, was synthesized by a chemist by the name of C.R. Adler Wright. He was a chemist in London, and at that point, that discovery went nowhere. <sighs> Jump forward about two decades, and diacetylmorphine was independently resynthesized by Felix Hoffman. He was a chemist for Bayer Pharmaceutical in Germany. Um, he was initially looking for codeine, which is less more potent than morphine, but instead found diacetylmorphine, which at that time was about two times more potent than morphine. At that point, it was reputed that the head of research at Bayer named it heroin after the German word heroish, meaning heroic or strong. And that's where the commercialization of heroin itself began. Here in the early 1900s is an ad that we're looking at for heroin, advertised as a cough lozenge or a cough suppressant. It was even advertised as soothing syrup for teething. Next, I'd like to talk about heroin and pop culture. Substance abuse is so ingrained in our culture. Sex, drugs, rock and roll, all of that, and a lot of pop culture figures have been embroiled in substance abuse issues. Um, there have been movies about it, Requiem for a Dream, Pulp Fiction, we're from Jersey, so The Sopranos, we see drug use all the time. Um, famous actors, John Belushi, uh, Robert Downey Jr. or Iron Man, repute multiple arrests and incarcerations for substance related issues. Prince died of an overdose, had elevated levels of opiates in his system. Whitney Houston, elevated levels of opiates and cocaine in her system as well. 
So how do opiates work and why do we get so addicted to these things? Heroin in particular, when taken by mouth, undergoes extensive metabolism. And when it's metabolized, it's broken down into a delivery system for morphine and it's not as addictive. When it's taken in a route other than by mouth, such as intravenously, snorting, etc., it passes, it bypasses this first past metabolism. The acetyl groups remain on and it remains fat soluble. Why is this important? Because when something is fat soluble, it crosses the blood brain barrier that much quicker. Once it gets into the brain, it breaks down into its constituents, holds onto the opiate receptors, and hijacks our reward system. That's where we get the rush of feel good hormones such as dopamine um, and that characteristic high from heroin. We were just talking about routes of administration. As heroin's purity has increased over the years, people no longer necessarily need to use intravenously to get that high. As the purity increases and heroin is cut with more potent synthetic opioids, people can now use it intranasally or by sniffing. They can smoke it and still get almost as good as a high as if they were to inject and to get rid of the stigma of injecting. <clears throat> so here, we see a couple of routes of administration, some paraphernalia we want to look out for. Uh, on the left are, uh, is a syringe, spoons, baggies, lighters, things we want to look out for. On the right is a young lady shown smoking heroin using tin foil, a jerry-rigged smoking pipe, and a lighter. A lesser known route of administration is called skin popping. If patients can't find a vein, whatnot, they'll take the syringe, uh, in, in, insert it into the fatty layer of their skin, and get their high that way. An even lesser known route is called plugging. They essentially make a suppository and insert it into their rectum or their vaginal cavity and it's absorbed that way. So we have talking about the purity increasing, um, synthetic opioids playing a role in, and heroin being cut with that and it's causing opioid overdoses. That's the reason why we're here. I just want to demonstrate a chart to kind of give you a depth of the strengths of the different things. If you look in the middle in blue is heroin. Heroin is somewhere on the order of five to eight times more potent than morphine. Move towards the right is fentanyl. I'm sure we've heard of it. Fentanyl mills coming from China, Mexico. Heroin's being laced with it left and right. Fentanyl alone is on the order of a hundred times more potent than morphine. Move more over to the right, you see car fentanyl. Cases are coming up in New Jersey. Carfentanil is essentially a large animal tranquilizer or, an, or an anesthetic. Carfentanil is on the order of 100,000 times more potent than morphine. As a result, we're getting more opioid overdoses. From 2014 to 2016, this chart demonstrates um, how opioid overdoses have increased in the hardest hit counties in New Jersey, Atlantic County, Cape May County, Cumberland County, and Ocean County. Now this is an important slide. Strategies to address the opioid overdose. A, there's increased access to naloxone. Our first responders, EMS, police, have all been trained on how to administer naloxone overdose kits to potentially save a life. Anyone taking CPR or basic life support is now educated about naloxone overdose kits. There's been legislation passed where now an individual can walk into a pharmacy and not need an individual prescription from a physician to obtain naloxone. Retail pharmacies are going out of their way to stock naloxone on their shelves. Walgreens and CVS uh, now readily carry naloxone on their pharmacy shelves and anyone can go in and pick it up. Passage of legislature. Uh, there's been the passage of Good Samaritan laws here in New Jersey and across the country. Um, typically, uh, when an overdose occurs, at some point, it's, it's witnessed. Um, there are various reasons as to why people don't immediately alert EMS. They, it could be that they're high as well, they're carrying drugs, they have warrants, things of that nature. The purpose of the Good Samaritan laws is to give these people protection to do the right thing and actively EMS right away when they suspect an overdose. There's the promotion of prescription monitoring programs. In New Jersey, it's the NJPMP where physicians can go ahead and look up our patients to see if they're prescribed narcotic medications to test whether they're doctor shopping or if there's any devious behavior going on. Prescription drug take back events, they're promoted all over the country at our town halls, municipalities, local schools, local police departments. 
say full opioid prescribing education. Um, there are talks done by the DEA. To maintain your DEA license as a physician, you have to take a course on opiates. Um, it, it's used to educate physicians on how to pres properly prescribe opioids, indications for prescribing, prescribing the lowest amount for the least bit frequency. Supervised injection facilities is an idea that's been thrown out as well, where people who aren't yet ready to get clean have a safe environment to go use, whether it be with clean needles to test their heroin and to be observed for any overdose. And finally, expansion of opioid agonist treatment, such as methadone and buprenorphine. So let's talk about evidence-based medicine treatment for heroin addiction. First, we have methadone or methadone maintenance programs. It's a form of opioid replacement therapy that reduces or eliminates the use of illicit opiates, the criminality associated with opiate use, and allows patients to improve their overall health and social productivity. Additionally, being enrolled in a methadone maintenance program prevents people from being uh, potentially exposed to several diseases, including HIV and hepatitis. So methadone is used to relieve narcotic craving, suppress the abstinence syndrome, and block the euphoric effects associated with opiates. Methadone has been found to be medically safe in pregnancy and is typically the gold standard when treating pregnant women who are also suffering from addiction. For those individuals who don't want to be maintained on methadone for long term, there are methadone reduction or detoxification programs. These programs work by getting a patient on methadone, titrating the medication to an adequate dose where they're comfortable, both physically and psychologically, and then at that point, slowly tapering off the medication with the appropriate psychosocial supports in place in order for them to maintain their abstinence once they're fully off the methadone. Another form of treatment is buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is a safer alternative to methadone uh, in opiate replacement due to its lower incidence of um, related overdoses. So how does buprenorphine work? Buprenorphine is a partial mu agonist, meaning um, there's a ceiling effect. Once you get to a certain dose, um, it kind of peters off. So if you take more than that, it doesn't continue, the effect doesn't continue to increase and the potential for overdose is not there. Both buprenorphine and methadone are used for detoxification, short and long-term opioid replacement. Buprenorphine, as I said, has the advantage of limiting the risk of overdose when taken in excess. Both buprenorphine and methadone have been shown to be effective in um, opioid addiction, and uh, both have high uh, retention rates. When it comes to buprenorphine at lower uh, doses, however, the retention rates drop when compared to methadone. So Suboxone, we'll, we'll show here. Suboxone is a, a form of buprenorphine. It's a, it's a mix of buprenorphine and naloxone uh, to avoid any illicit use. The naloxone kicks in when anybody tries to break it down and use it intravenously or in a route that it's not meant to be taken. Um, the two main formulations here are in tablet form and sublingual form. More recently, in 2006, the FDA approved probupine. It's the first implantable buprenorphine. Um, it's, it's as small as a matchstick. It's a minimally invasive procedure that takes place in an outpatient office. Um, it's inserted subdermally, usually on the inside of your upper arm, and it releases a slow and steady dose of buprenorphine for up to six months. This was created to increase compliance uh, and convenience for patients who are suffering from opioid addiction. Um, some setbacks or some, some barriers to fully utilizing this is the fact that it's so new, uh, most or almost no insurances cover it. The cost is about $5,000. Um, and finally, it, even though it is minimally invasive, it is still somewhat invasive and you do run the risk of infection. Here it is. Um, if you look, it's about the size of a matchstick and it goes, again, inserted subdermally. Now, Trexone is another route you can go when it comes to opioid addiction. Now, Trexone is an opioid antagonist. It blocks the euphoric effects of opiates. Um, this is used in people who don't really want to feel the euphoric effects of opiates. However, it has minimal use on cravings. Most studies have shown it's more effective actually with alcoholics. So if you have a person who's an alcoholic and using opiates, you might want to consider this. This also is available in a monthly injection, again, to improve compliance. And it's, its cost is about $1,000, but most insurances do cover it. 
So there are dimorphine clinics elsewhere, um, not really in the States, mostly in Europe, Europe, where people with failed methadone and other routes are actually given pharmaceutical grade heroin to uh, maintain their cravings and be functional in society. Um, it's the harm reduction approach, so they're not um, at risk for criminality, um, associated transmittable diseases, things of that nature. So medications alone aren't the cure for opiate addiction. Um, you have to take a multimodal approach and non-pharmacologic approaches. Study after study have shown that 12-step 12-step programs are very effective. Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous. This was a study done by the NIH, and it showed that inner city minorities who had a long history of crack or heroin use, um, who continuously attended uh, 12-step programs, had a much higher retention, retention rate and lower relapse rate when compared to those um, who did not attend uh, a 12-step program as frequently. When it comes to therapy, uh, as clinicians, sometimes we use motivational, utilize motivational interviewing. It's an offshoot of cognitive behavioral therapy. Here, we work with the patient almost as teammates in kind of uh, playing with their ambivalence on wanting to get sober, what's stopping them, and working together as a team in terms of uh, developing an approach to maintain abstinence. Uh, this method I found uh, works because it gives the patient autonomy. It makes them think they're coming to their own conclusion, and as a result, they're uh, more likely to kind of stick to the plan because it's their own plan. Some basic things we can do uh, with regards to relapse prevention and staving off cravings. The good thing about a craving is it only lasts 15 to 30 minutes. And addressing those 15 to 30 minutes with anyone who's at risk for relapse is tremendous. Um, we typically say, we encourage people to talk to someone when they're having cravings, uh, wait 30 minutes, distract themselves, do something they enjoy, watch television, go for a run, um, utilize relaxation techniques, anything to get through those 30 minutes. Typically after those 30 minutes are passed, they reassess the situation, they realize the craving is gone. I know it's easier said than done, but it has worked. Another important thing is to encourage people to take their recovery day by day. A lot of times people in recovery self-sabotage because they get overwhelmed. They start thinking, how am I gonna stay sober for the next week? How am I gonna go stay sober for the next year, 10 years? And, and they kind of give up, they get hopeless. It's important to encourage them to take their recovery in bite-sized pieces, take it day by day. And it's also good to encourage them to relax, whatever it be, yoga, Epsom salt baths, exercise, because recovery is stressful. <clears throat> Here, this is another study uh, funded by the NIH, again, proving the point that not just medications are needed, but a multimodal approach. Uh, this study just simply shows that people enrolled in a methadone maintenance program were put in three groups. Uh, one group with minimal counseling, another group with standard counseling, and another group with enhanced services. And as expected, those in the enhanced services groups had lower rates of relapse. Finally, I'd like to talk about the role of diet in addiction. A lot of people who are suffering from addiction or actively using don't particularly care for themselves. That includes their diet. So we, it's important to educate them about their diet when they're in recovery. A lot of times they'll be vitamin depleted and vitamin depletion can lead to mood disorders, irritability, things of that nature, which can enhance their, uh, the possibility of cravings. Educate them about getting complex carbs, exercising to release those feel-good endorphins and to alleviate cravings. Uh, repleting their vitamins, to, again, to make sure that their body is kind of back to homeostasis, is reset. Uh, educate them to hydrate themselves well. Avoid caffeine because it can, again, uh, cause dehydration. Finally, minimize the bad stuff. Minimize the sugars, the processed foods, because that avoids us having a steady stream of energy throughout the day and causes those ebbs and flows and crashes in our mood and our energy, which can precipitate cravings again. Um, eat high protein fiber diets and eat small regular meals, again, to maintain that homeostasis and that balance of energy throughout the day. Thank you. Okay, so at this time, uh, first, thank you, Dr. Um, uh, Jerry and Dr. Uh, Mike Kelly. And we're gonna invite the panel to come up now, if you could, please.
Hello. Okay, so um, we're gonna go to Q&A. Um, Lauren is just gonna speak for three minutes to share her story about um, her brother, and then we're just gonna open it up. Anyone who has a question for any one of the panelists. So we have Gail, we have Lainey, we have Lauren, and our two wonderful doctors. Okay. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Um, I am here tonight because I lost my brother, Carter Stone, to a heroin overdose seven months ago on September 26, 2017. My brother was 32 years old. He was kind, he was compassionate, he was funny, gentle, hardworking. He was a son, a brother, an uncle, a cousin, a friend, a godfather. He was someone that I loved deeply, but also really liked and chose to spend a lot of time with. He simply was a good guy who got caught up in something that was way over his head. My brother's opioid addiction started following a car accident in fall of 2015. He suffered a back injury and needed help in managing the pain. He was incredibly hesitant about taking opioids at first, but ultimately was having a very difficult time getting through his days. He sought medical treatment and was prescribed various opioids over the course of a few months. While managing the pain, that is when we believe his addiction formed. My brother was working a very successful job at the time that he had been at for about four years and was able to financially support his own addiction. Eventually, the red flags of addiction caught up with him. About a year following this car accident, he lost his job, and when you lose your job, you lose the financial means to support your habit, and that's when you turn to the streets. That's when dealers strike, often glamorizing the switch to heroin. It being a cheaper expense, as low as $5 a bag, and promised as a better high. What they don't tell you when they are selling you this drug is that it's going to hook into your system, never let go, and will send you down a dark path to hell, taking everyone that loves you along for the ride they never wanted to get on. My brother once said to me, Lauren, imagine being stranded in the woods and seeing your kids starve to death. What will you do to keep them alive? Addicts live in constant survival mode. They have anxiety and obsessiveness surrounds them, knowing that in four to five hours, their current high will wear off and they'll need to find their next fix. They do not do this with any intention of hurting anyone. They do not want this life. Their brains are altered. It is a grueling life that many don't want to live, but don't know how to get out, and also do not have the strength to get through a withdrawal. Fall 2016 is when we were made aware of the gravity of the situation. Two men came barging into my brother's townhouse that he was no longer living in, looking for him. My aunt at the time was there, in which she shared that my brother, in which they shared that my brother had a heroin problem and that he owed them money. We had zero clue that my brother was doing heroin. This information was immediately communicated to me, and I honestly didn't know what scared me more. The fact that my brother had people looking for him that could potentially hurt or kill him, or that he was doing heroin. I was now operating in a world of disbelief, panic, and fear for him and for us. I told him he was packing his things, getting help, and he was leaving the state of New Jersey. He moved up to Vermont to live with his mom and start his recovery process. Things did not go as hoped for. It was an emotionally devastating year for us. He was really, really struggling, and we were terrified for what was to come at any given moment. After spending the fall and winter in Vermont, living a life that he never ever thought would be his reality, towards the end of spring 2017, we knew that he needed longer term treatment. He willingly entered into a recovery house back in southern New Jersey and was doing incredible. At that point in time, we were beating this addiction and I was never ever going to be talking at a forum like tonight's. He was doing everything right. He was working through the 12-step program. He was working on finding his faith again. He was going to group meetings regularly. He was very open and honest about his story and wanted to help others. We were incredibly proud of him. I felt like I had my brother back he was crystal clear, mind, body, and soul, and with every fiber of his being, never ever wanted to touch that poison again. After completing the three-month inpatient program, he moved into an apartment very close to the recovery facility and was willingly being checked on and drug tested at random. His next step was to find a job and continue to focus on recovering and putting his life back together. An incredible job opportunity presented itself that he accepted and was so hopeful and excited for his future for the first time in a while. But I think at that point in time, everyday life stress started to slowly creep back into his life and affected him way more than he could verbalize or knew how to handle from a healthy standpoint. 
I talked to my brother on Saturday, he was happy and sounded great. I talked to my brother on Sunday, he was happy and he sounded great. He talked to his sponsor Monday morning, there were no red flags. He talked to his mom at 5 p.m., there were no red flags. His roommate came home, my brother was still in a suit from work. They watched a sports game and eventually made their way up to bed. Their rooms were four feet apart from each other. My brother was found dead in his room the next day from a one-time relapse of heroin that killed him instantly. What I wish I knew then that I know now is that addiction is a disease. And something as small as a pain pill with long-term use has the ability to really affect the human brain. That combined with heroin use is a recipe for disaster. I think when you understand that your loved one is suffering from a disease, you come from a place of compassion and understanding. And when you come from a place of compassion and understanding, you are able to communicate and provide support in the right way. You are able to communicate from a place of love versus anger, reinforcing that even though they are good today, that their disease of addiction can strike them tomorrow with a vengeance. They have to be prepared to fight every single day and for many for the rest of their lives. And that is just a very, very small snapshot of the two years that we lived before losing my brother. Thank you, Lauren. Okay. So anybody who has a question, I'll come over with a microphone and it can be for anybody on the panel. Lainey in the middle is a, a, a therapist. Gail at the end lost her son. You know Lauren's story and you heard from the doctors. So anybody with a question, just throw your hand in the air. question about Dr. Jerry, I think. Um, you mentioned briefly um, supervised injection sites, and I was wondering if you do see like people there. Do people actually go to these supervised injection sites? And speaking of cost, if we can have an injection site, why are we holding back from the treatment of... Um, hold up. Um, the in treatment where they input something into your body, the $5,000 treatment, the one that's not covered by insurance, I'm sorry. So to, to the best of my knowledge, there are no supervised injection sites in the state of New Jersey as of yet. Um, it's been used uh, a lot in Canada, I believe, and Europe, um, and there uh, are talks amongst, amongst the addiction community in uh, trying to incorporate this as kind of like a harm reduction approach. Um, with regards to the probupine, it's, it's um, just newly approved by the FDA, and insurance companies will do anything. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm biased, but um, you know they want you to try the, the most cost-effective routes first before getting to things that may cost them that much, and show that uh, I've had to do prior authorizations left and right for various medications. Show that you've tried, you know, X amount of medications to a therapeutic dose before they even consider approving uh, a medication of that cost. It's just the nature of, you know, dealing with insurance companies and pharmaceuticals, unfortunately. Thank you, Jerry. Okay. Um, this is for either of the doctors. Okay. Uh, two questions, actually. One, you had mentioned um, Percocets for the wisdom teeth surgery, like, briefly. I know that when I got my wisdom teeth out, I used Toradol via um, intravenous. How effective do you think that could be as an alternative for some surgeries? Yeah, so um, we mentioned it because um, I gave a lecture out in, in Vegas to the oral surgeons and they, they actually, they write almost as many opioid prescriptions as orthopedists do. And so it was a, that was something that they had been using. We used Toradol. Oh, yeah. yeah, I think it's very reasonable. In, the, in, in our area, we worry a little bit about the side effect of bleeding. Um, but there are people who, who swear by Toro, um, so they, they use it yeah. a fair amount. Yeah, so I think it's pretty reasonable. Yeah, and then for Dr. Jerry, I was just wondering um, if there was anything you could do for a sibling or any addict, I guess, who was detoxing. Um, obviously, it's a very painful, gross-like thing. Yeah, process to go through. Um, anything you could do to make it more comfortable for them, or um, yeah. So when when someone is detoxing, depending on the setting that they're in, um, we 
uh, anticipate them to be uncomfortable. Uh, there will be a certain level of being uncomfortable irrespective of whatever we're doing, because it is, you know, your body has been using this drug for X amount of years, and for you to get off it isn't going to take 10 days. Um, uh, there, there's well documented um, a prolonged program of withdrawal symptoms that may last, you know, a year, two years, primarily being insomnia and things related of that nature, and anxiety, and we treat those things with uh, non-narcotic approaches. Uh, we take a multimodal approach, uh, depending on the symptom, be it, for example, insomnia. We educate them about sleep hygiene. We try non-narcotic medications. Uh, to assist with sleep, such as trazodone or doxepin, which may also help their mood, and kind of individually assess them, see what they're going through, and try and adequately address um, that issue without resorting to uh, necessarily upping the dose of opiate, et cetera. I just want to add one thing to that, and perhaps Jerry might comment. Essentially, I got a call maybe six months ago from a young man who grew up in my town and uh, it was. Um, did different sports with my son, and he called me. I said, "You know, this is so and so. Do you remember me?" And I said, "Yeah, sure. How you doing?" He said, well, "I'm a recovering alcoholic and heroin addict, and I've been clean for three years." And he introduced me to a product that is almost like a hearing aid. It sits in your ear and it stimulates the inner ear, and um, it, it's rather small. It's in. It's been okay in a couple states around the country, not New Jersey yet. I don't know if Jerry's known about it or not, but. Evidently, it's helped a great deal with cravings. You know, worked for about eight days or so. Have you, did you ever hear anything about that? I, I, I just read an article um, on it. I, do, I never personally experienced it, and to the best to the best of my knowledge, um, it isn't utilized in New Jersey as of yet. Right. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Uh, hi, uh, doctor. If uh, if uh, suboxone is effective, why then do people go through the painful de detox process that was just asked about. What, why, why put people through that if this, these other drugs are effective? So, Suboxone, as I mentioned, is a partial mu agonist, meaning that it works on the receptor to a certain extent, as opposed to heroin, which is a full mu agonist. Uh, the, the analogy I like to take is that um, if you get behind the wheel of a car, you mash down the pedal with a full agonist, you're, you know, you're hitting 200. With a partial agonist, you mash down on the pedal, you get to 70 and you stay there. Um, the reason for this is uh, we want to minimize uh, abuse of the, of the replacement medication, right? And we also want to limit the potential for potential overdose with the medication that we're prescribing them. Hi, uh, this question is for both the doctors. Uh, you Obviously, you have two very different backgrounds. One is a surgeon, and the other one uh, does pain management. And you guys brought up two different, very unique cases as to why this addiction or why the overdose happens. You made an allusion to um, recreational use and diversion results in recreational use and having that overdose. Whereas you, I think, really addressed it more of the constant use and having that overdose based on um, probably starting from a legitimate use, getting overboard, and having that overdose. So of the two, which one is a more pressing issue? Which one's a more pressing problem that we should address? I'm not sure I really understand the question because I think once you're in Jerry's world, that's a pretty pressing deal. In my world, we're trying to minimize you getting into that position. So we were coming at it in different ways, but you know, some the, certainly some of the treatments that we did in the past, and we've just heard from her poor brother, you know, he didn't ask for that spinal injury. People didn't ask for shoulder surgery. They didn't ask for what, the, I mean, I've had almost 15 surgeries and never had any kind of buzz from any of those pills. Some people take one and that's, they're on. And so I, I think they're probably pretty equal as far as what's more pressing, I would suspect, Jerry's stuff. So in terms of getting into use, you know, each, each case is unique. Um, I see patients, you know, who have had legitimate reasons for being prescribed opiates and then due to regulations uh, the physician gets scared of them being prescribing opiates for so long cutting them off and not knowing what to do and coming to see me uh, I've seen people uh, that have gotten into using other drugs uh, stumbled upon heroin and got addicted that way I've seen people um, 
who at a young age maybe attended bill parties or things of that nature and got introduced to it that way. People from different walks of life, different experiences, and different reasons for why they're using. Unfortunately, uh, the, the outcome could be similar, meaning death in, in each one of those cases. Okay, next question. Hi, I, don't, I haven't heard Gail's story, but um, I have three small children and I sort of came tonight, well, first of all, pretty inviting, thank you, um, but to get more knowledge. Um, how should we be talking to our kids, especially our young kids, about this epidemic before, you know, sorry, don't use it? <laughs> Any more, you know, specific advice about how to talk to our kids about that stuff? You really, can you hear me? Is this on? Um, you really can't start young enough. Um, it's as simple as having a conversation even when they're younger, you know, that, you know, you don't need to eat candy or drink a Red Bull to change how you feel, you know, that's a, a good starting point. Um, but really just to keep that conversation open and, you know, a lot of it, you know, for my son, I mean, he had been prescribed opiates and, you know, it's, it's having that knowledge that you don't need them. You know, they do have a place in medicine, but you know, if your, your ch children are getting your wisdom teeth out or they don't need them. So it's, it's that knowledge of that you have alternatives and, you know, not opening that door for them to be exposed to it. And you know, a lot of people talk about you know the, the peer pressure that the kids have even in high school or middle school. You know, you're out at a party and, and you're in an in a, um, environment where something's going on, and what do you do? And you don't want to not feel cool. You know, so I've heard people say, well, have a code word and text your mother. You know that word, and she calls, and you know it's as simple as, oh my God, we have a family emergency. I'm sorry, I have to go. You know, and teach them to remo remove themselves from the situation. I'd like to just add something to that. Um, one thing that we were talking about, a couple of parents and I before this, um, is also if you have small children, um, one thing that we're seeing a lot of, um, and this relates to the peer pressure, um, is the impact of social media. And um, today, um, uh, there's a young man whose parents are here, Justin, who um, is part of an org organization that they started never end the fight and he posted a great article that's actually on my facebook page um and i know that this is all about the medication but i just sort of want to keep this um because i think it is important um the role of social media is causing incredible anxiety and distress uh for for the young folks today i had a sixth grader in front of me who was just so upset about something that was posted um so what I was talking about with uh, the parents earlier is just the importance even of removing the phones and setting rules just like you do for other things, as well as encourage, encouraging kids to have hobbies. Back in the day, our grandparents and our parents had endless um, hobbies. So I was saying like, my grandmother could cross stitch, knit, you know, all sorts of things. My grandfather did trains and our kids don't have hobbies. So to Gail's point about the peer pressure, um, giving them other alternatives to do and to be a part of and to have a meaningful life just sort of takes them away from some of that. Um, and hopefully maybe that even changes the type of socialization that they have as they grow, um, which therefore decreases the chances of being involved in a, peer, a, a pill party or something like that. So even though it's a little, I'm sort of coming in the back door, but it's all related. Thank you, next question. This is a pain management question. Um, if you have a child who's away in college or in their early 20s and has had bad back or some sort of sports injury has been operated on and um, has been popping Advil and Tylenol and has, you know, there's side effects of that, their stomach's not quite right, they, throw up a lot more often or things like that. And they're away from home and you really can't control what they're going to do, but they may be tempted to take painkillers. Is there anything down the pipe that's going to be a substitute for living on, on, on an ongoing basis with on Advil or Tylenol or something like that? Because they're young people. Yeah, no, um, um, so I, I had even, my, my own daughter broke her collarbone. She was not that far away, she was in New York. But um, I put her on round-the-clock Tylenol and uh, Advil. Calls me on a Sunday evening, screaming because her pain is getting bones hurt. And uh, we can't. One of the reasons we used to give so many pills is 
we can't call in prescriptions on opioids, and certainly not in New York. I actually had a uh, tramadol prescription for my dog. I almost went and filled uh, to just get her through the night. But one of my partners, could, but we, in, in her case, it was acute pain. It wasn't a chronic thing. And so if the chronic thing has gotten to be where, you know, the Tylenol and the Advil and the different type, maybe the Celebrex or other different things, is really not working, I think the first thing you do is got to figure out why is it hurting? And, and is it hurting that much? And, and has the diagnosis been wrong? I mean, you, typically we can, we don't see too much chronic pain in that age group. It's been more that they've, they've gotten into less about chronic pain, but whatever, for whatever reason, and I don't know it, they've taken the opioids and they just kind of like them. And the second thing that we do in our practice is we have a pain management group at Hackensack. And if we're getting into a situation where that's going to need to be managed, which you don't, one of the things that the physician monitoring program allows you, I think we're what, see if you may know, but 22 states, 24 states, I and mean, it's not just New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, but we're hooked up to, I think, 22 other states. And so going to doctor shopping is much harder for them to do now than they have before. So we, every time we start, you know, ordering, we, we look at, it's not mandatory, but it's, it's a good thing to do. So I, I would, one, find out why is it still hurting, and, and, and particularly in the back stuff. And then two, um, that person may need to come home and see a pain specialist or get someone referred to, because you don't want a lot of different people managing that pain. Thank you. I just wanted to add some thoughts. I'm a practicing physician in the area for about 31 years, and, and there are many different approaches to this drug problem, and part of it comes from, for the physicians themselves, the whole concept of, of uh, pain, pain management physicians who overdo the prescribing, but I think it's very important that the patient be aware that they can drive it as well. The silly example that I would cite in, in, a, in an office is a patient coming in convinced that they need antibiotics for a viral syndrome, and most physicians are well aware that that doesn't serve a purpose. And I would, so I would, I would just add that the purpose of this, of this committee here, I think, is to, to make patients aware that they are also driving the use of narcotic analgesics when they pressure the physician to prescribe it. And the awareness of the patient to um, tone down that demand is a very positive force in reducing those unnecessary and exaggerated prescribing. Thank you. My question is, after like a back surgery, and the patient has been on an opioid, um, how long should it take for him to come off the medication, and when would that first red flag come up to indicate that there is a problem? Yeah, so I, I, don't, I can't comment on a back patient because I haven't okay. seen one since 1985, but um, on the knee side, I think it depends on the surgery, what was done. So like an arthroscopy should probably not need anything past a weekend. Um, an ACL surgery, depending on where the, the, the ACL surgery itself, done all arthroscopically, is not terribly, terribly painful, but it's where you take the graft from, you know, to make the new ACL, and sometimes if it's in the front of your knee, that can be quite painful. So we, we try to manage that with a block intraoperatively to get you through the first couple of days so you're not taking too many of the pills. But I'd say, oh gosh, usually not more than two weeks now. Yair, do you have any other comment on that? Um, well, that's all right. I'll, and then total knees, now, I mean, we, we really get them, um, we're finding, our nurse navigators are finding more and more patients that we call at three weeks, where they're taking the Celebrex and the, and the uh, Tylenol, and very few. So we, I would say, the, the red flag has become a lot less uh, for that reason, and the, they can't go to other people. Usually the red flag gets a little bit, you don't always see it because in the old days they would go to a different doctor, and now they can't do that with the physician monitoring, or go to New York to a different doctor, but they can't do that either. Thank you. Yeah, no, yeah there's prescription laws, so it makes it a lot more difficult to do it. You have to have a contract with your physician on understanding pain and what you're getting and the whole deal. And then I think that's probably been a pretty good one. Yeah. 
Hi, so this question is for the doctors. You've kind of addressed how you know, you're going forward within the medical community with existing physicians um, and nurses and medical providers as far as um, bringing attention to this problem. Taking a step back, I'm applying to medical school right now, so to residents, to medical students, to those of us interested in entering the field, is there any talk kind of of how, you're, how it's going to be that uh, this topic is going to be broached with those of us entering the field? Like, you know, taking it back to those of us beginning as far as how it's going to be addressed in that way? You know, I can't speak for individual medical schools. Um, I would think, you know, definitely, we're, we're actually just getting started with um, our Hackensack Meridian Medical School. We're, we're um, if you're applying, we're looking for 55 uh, students in July. Yeah. We're interviewing on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we're getting tremendous people. Yeah, well, good. Um, we're trying to figure exactly out where that belongs, but it will definitely be part of the discussion. I was supposed to be at a meeting in Seton Hall by the dean of the law school tomorrow, and um, trying to have a, that discussion in that world as well. But I guarantee you, it will be involved. I mean, I was just approached by um, Bergen Pack, FBI, Lakeland Bank, they're looking for some money from Hackensack, which we are going to do, to try to come together. To, I mean, to Gail's point, I don't know that we have a, in, the, in the state, a statewide approach to opioids at the middle school level. Not at the high school level, but at the middle school level. And we're going to be working on a curriculum for Bergen County middle schools together. I don't know how much I'll be in one. But... Uh, that's a great question that you raise. Um, ironically, uh, the research that I did during fellowship was uh, resident physician awareness with regards to um, addressing uh, opioid use disorders. And what my research found is simply that um, residents in training especially didn't talk about drug use because it was an uncomfortable topic and they simply didn't have appropriate knowledge on it and that was a, one of the biggest deterring factors for them. Um, so over at Montefiore, we started um, a lecture series um, with our residents uh, from psychiatry and we expanded it to medicine, uh, educating residents on how to broach the topic of substance use and educating them about naloxone overdose and the different uh, modal modalities to treat suspected substance use and what resources uh, they have in their armamentarium so they would feel more confident in addressing patients. Thank you, next question. First of all, I, I applaud you know, everybody for bringing forward the education standpoint, and I thought, Dr. Kelly, your overview of the multimodal treatment is so good. I feel like one of the challenges is, as a parent, when your child, you know, college age, high school age, or younger, is injured and you're going into a surgery, you don't know and you don't know, you know, what the medications are. And I was thinking about how you talked about the different choices that there are, the non-opioid and the Tylenol, but there's a limit on the amount of Tylenol that they feel like with livers. And so in a situation that I was in, my feeling was that a child's liver is probably pretty good but there are mandated rules that they would only give a certain amount of Tylenol to manage the pain. Yeah. So how do we grand. argue? Yeah, no. I have another question. So was the question whether the Tylenol was, you needed to do something beyond Tylenol or? Yeah, no, fair enough, I get it. And so I think one of the take home messages here is that you need to treat the pain. If you're in a car accident, you break your neck or you break your spine or you have bad you know, fractures or your knee, these things hurt a lot. And some of the things we're doing here are helpful in minimizing opioids, but not necessarily completely replacing them. I think what we've seen on the horizon is, is the, the um, the rush to try to bring opioids that can't be abused 
you know, rather than, you know, not opioids that may not have an addiction profile, but they can't be, you can't be crushed and put in a, you know, and snorted and everything else. That kind of thing's coming along. But I, I think that the, there, there are times when you, you need, I mean, in the old days, we used to tell you to take a pill one hour before therapy so you could be more effective. I mean, we don't do that anymore, but that was a very effective way to help people through the pain of trying to get their range of motion back and things like that. So I think it's got to be kind of a team thing where you're keeping an eye on it and the surgeon's keeping an eye on it and your son or daughter is educated. And, but I mean, they have, I mean, my daughter, we gave her short um, prescriptions uh, for pain, not lots of pills, and, and within two weeks I was able to get her off it. Hold on. So there's other people waiting. I've got to pass the mic. Um, I, uh, I recently was uh, checking the literature about mindfulness based stress reduction and uh, hypnosis training for management of pain and um, chronic pain and acute pain and preparation of the patients for surgery. And I wonder. Do you think patients, giving the patients power to take care of their pain could be an option? And can they help you? Yeah, I, I think um, all those things are part of it. When you leave um, our, our hospital after your two-day stay for a joint or your one-day stay, we give you a list of those various things. You know what happens with some of these things? So let's take acupuncture. Probably very helpful. No insurance pays for it. They pay for the opioids, but they don't pay for the acupuncture or other types of therapy or other stuff. You need to be see a psychiatrist to work on some mindfulness or something along those lines. A, a lot of those things are limited by nobody pays for them. And we may find the same thing with our genetic testing. I know that the, the psychiatrists you guys use for people with depression, they have the same metabolic profiles where you could get three drugs in the same family and not metabolize any of them, but they can decide that ahead of time. So like for the patient, if it's my son having a spine surgery, I'm getting the genetic testing and making sure I know what's, but, but I have the money to pay for it. I don't know whether insurance will. Thank you. Um, I was struck by a comment that you had mentioned. There was a study done where people who were given opioids post-surgery, when they were served, there were over 4,000 pills that were left over cumulatively between that group. Is there any consideration for doctors to not prescribe 30 days worth of pills? And you can't anymore. That? It's against the law. It and has so, to be 30 days? No, 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 you can't. You, 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 there's, there's, in New Jersey has a different law than Massachusetts, than some of the other ones, but everybody's now restricting the number of pills, the lowest possible dose of the given pill, and the number of days per prescription. And so you, that doesn't work anymore. It doesn't happen. Yeah, so that's, and, and if you're going to be on prolonged, as Dr. Kisson said, that's the third level, and there's a contract, and it's a, it's a big deal. And it's interesting, we talked about the pain people. They're writing less, they, they're seeing less and less chronic pain people coming in for prescriptions than they ever have because of these laws. I had a question um, for the doctors. How do you determine two things? Which drug to put a patient on for the... Um, to prevent the withdrawal once they are they're decided to come clean, and how long do they need to stay on the medication? Is there a tapering process? Do you cater it to each patient? How, do, how does that work? Um, so, in terms of detoxification, it's uh, individually catered um, on a case by case basis. Um, you have to take a look uh, at, at the whole picture, kind of like a biopsychosocial profile. Um, we understand that there's the substance abuse aspect of it, but we have to evaluate um, where they are in terms of their mental health, whether that needs to be addressed socially, if they're working, uh, they don't have a place to stay, support system, all these things play a factor in us determining um, how quickly or how long to taper a patient off these medications. Um, it's a multimodal approach. Um, they need to be engaged in treatment, not only with a psychiatrist, but with a therapist, show that they're making their appointments, um, show um, you know, clean urine toxicologies, and it, there's, there's individual protocols for individual hospitals uh, and, and um, systems, but it 
long story short, it's it's individually catered. I can talk to you about it in, uh, in private, but depending on the patient and what they're looking for and the kind of social supports and uh, biopsychosocial profile they have, we cater a detoxification program uh, tailored to that. Thank you. So I've heard it here tonight, and I've heard it other places too, that the opioids change the brain. The, I'm assuming that's a physical change in the brain. Uh, and does that mean that that's permanent, or does, can that be, can, it, can therapies and uh, getting off the drugs for a while change it back to the way it was? Or do I totally misunderstand the whole thing? Again, people who are already hooked on pills. Yeah, so I don't have the answer to that. I'm not sure anybody does. Um, I mean, I've heard from Gail, I mean, the one pill, if you don't, if you don't have any pain, you take one pill and you're hooked for life. Um, what we're trying to do is, is, we're looking at the metabolism. So we're trying not to give you, so what would happen, we give you morphine for your, for your big surgery, be very reasonable, but if you didn't have the right enzyme in your body to break that down into the parts of the morphine that would relieve your pain, you would, through other metabolic pathways, get the adverse effects, like throwing up, et cetera, and then your pain, you, we'd come in and say, how's your pain? And you go, oh my God, it's a 10. What's gonna happen then? You're gonna get another shot of something that doesn't help you. And so what we're trying to do is, we're trying to just figure out how to give you the appropriate medicine, not necessarily are we gonna know whether you get the one shot and you happen. You know what I don't get, and, and maybe, maybe some of the people who've been through it, We've been, since 1995, I was probably doing 100 ACLs a year, which is a lot, okay, just from our practice profile. We took care of the next, we took care of the next, we were all in the city, and we were giving out Percocet to every single patient. And we weren't giving them five pills, we were telling them for two to three weeks, take a pill before therapy, if, if, particularly if you were 25, 30 years old, to get your range of motion, to get this, to get that. We were giving you PCA so that when you came out, because we, were, we weren't doing it arthroscopically, and you were using IV opioids, and we're doing the same thing with our total joints, and we didn't have this data. We didn't have everybody getting hooked. We didn't have, you know, the, the, any of you who are interested in this, read a book called Dreamland, if you want to watch the heroin go around this country and follow the pills. It's written by a Mexican guy, and, and this, all this stuff comes from a very poor area of Mexico. But I don't get, like we were just talking about, I don't get exactly why the same stresses 20 years ago weren't causing as much anxiety. The same pills 20 years ago weren't causing as much. Maybe the pills are stronger now, I don't know. But I went back and rigged my brain as I looked at this, trying to figure out who I was hurting in the 90s or the early 2000s. And I didn't see this. So I don't know that answer, and I sure wish I did, and I'm sure there's a couple people on this panel who wish they did as well. Okay, but, gonna, so I don't have the answer. We're gonna go with one last question due to time. Hi, first I'd just like to say I'm sorry for the loss of your son and your brother. I think you're very brave to be here. My question is a medical question. From your um, medical perspective, how do you feel about the rise of quote-unquote medical marijuana with pain relief, anxiety, depression, all of these things? Thank God this was the last question. <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm, I was actually with the Commissioner of Health last week who was, um, was uh, very vocal about the expression of medical marijuana in this, in this particular state broadly to include visceral and skeletal pain. And um, I've been following a lot of the cannabidiol. So when, for everybody, so the cannabinoids, right? You have the THC, which is what gets you high. And then you have what's called cannabidiol. And that comes from the hemp plant. And it doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. And that's what you actually can get legally here. I don't even think you need a medical thing. I put it on my shoulder. I got it in California. 
because it has anti-inflammatory effects. There was a pill just released a, a week ago of CBD in, um, in, from a pharmaceutical company for um, juvenile seizures. I've heard for years that, I mean, people would go to, to, to um, Colorado when their child had seizures and wasn't responding to things. So I don't know what to say that I'm a fan, but I, I'm a very interested observer and have used the CBD on myself, you know, for shoulder problems, for musculoskeletal things, and been told to use it for things like anxiety or you don't sleep too well. And there's a lot of, once we get to the level two of the federal stuff, I think we can start getting money to do real studies, not pharmaceutical companies in the cannabis world trying to, to not do the right kind of study. But if you get to one level down from it being legally the way it is now, we'll be able to get those studies. And um, a lot of people think that a lot of the NFL people use all that stuff for pain in addition to rec recreation because they stay away from the opioids. But some of the, some of the um, states where they have that have less opioid overdoses, but then they'll tell you they have more problems with driving and stuff like that. So I'm a fan of observation at this point, yeah. All right, I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank the panel. Thank Alyssa, the River, Allendale, and the NMA.